A reading from Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 to 16. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men, that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. This is the word of the Lord. We are continuing on with this uh, sermon series on kingdom culture. Uh, before we begin, come let us go to God in prayer. Father, help us to hear, hear with our hearts, strengthen our desire, our whole being to love you and to serve you and to live in accordance to your ways. We know it is only possible because you have given us your spirit. So still our hearts and help us to hear. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In the last uh, two sermons, Jesus began by telling us what is it that re is really required for us to have a blessed life, a truly happy life. And it's wonderful to know that the God of all, Jesus Christ, uh, He tells us what is really in our core being, what we are really pursuing, what it means to truly be satisfied and happy. But of course, when he gave us the eight characteristics in the Beatitudes, there are something that I know some of you are saying, oh, pastor, very hard, lah. very hard to do, wow, to be, to be merciful, to, you know, seek after God's righteousness. But I want to remind us that, you know, Jesus Christ has given us his spirit and he's telling us that we need to rewire the way we think because we are so often thinking that we have to do it on our own, but it's not. You know, the kingdom culture, the characteristic of living in God's kingdom, it is first and foremost enabled by God Himself. But the thing is that these characteristics that we are to live out, being spiritually poor and needy, uh, merciful, uh, being meek, uh, willing to suffer for the sake of God, all these characteristics, not only that it draws God's blessing, you know, and the blessings are abundant, we, need, we know, right? Uh, God gives us uh, uh, His kingdom, He allows us to inherit the earth, He satisfies us and He gives us mercy and so on and so forth. But not only that, when we live out the characteristics of the kingdom, when we live out the life God desires us to live, you know what happens? We become visible to others. So that brings me to the first point, that it's impossible to live the kingdom characteristic in private. Turn to the person next to you and tell the person, you have to live it not in private. Not in private. Because the people who exhibit the life of God will become visible unto others. You know why? When we are alive, that attracts God's blessing because we walk in His ways. God will also make us a conduit, a channel of blessing unto others. Do you get what I'm saying? When you are one that is blessed by God, God will use you to be a blessing to others. And it's very interesting why we cannot live the kingdom characteristic without being visible to others because Jesus himself tells us this is how we are to relate to our, our world. Jesus, in these verses, establishes our relationship with our world, our surrounding. Jesus says to us, You are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. Jesus is not suggesting, maybe you can consider to be a bit of a salt. Lah. Maybe you can consider to be light. No. Jesus is making a statement, telling us, even though when we feel we don't really 
feel like we are able to live out the kingdom characteristics, but Jesus is telling us, with His strength and with His help, you are, and you are itself. It is in the uh, present active indicative. What does it mean? It means that it is action, active action in present, in the present. All right, when you talk about salt, if you put salt into water, for example, immediately the presence of the salt into the water changes the water, right? If you cause salt water and if you have a sore throat or itchy throat, you just gargle the salt water, it kills bacteria. Uh, you don't, maybe you don't even need to buy expensive lozenges, you know. It clears your throat. Salt with its active presence in its environment changes the environment automatically by its presence. Light, when you have a room that is absolutely dark, the moment you turn on the light, it changes completely, right? The room is no longer dark, but it's bright. It's lit up. The presence, the active presence of that salt and light changes its environment. So Jesus is saying, we who are called by Him, who has been saved by Him to live out the kingdom's norm, we are to relate to our world as an influence of change. This is who we are by our active presence. But you see, change can be positive or negative, right? In the last five years, we have a uh, change of four governments. All right? Sometimes not all changes are for good, right? But here, if we are Christians, we are to be an agent of change by our presence, by the way we live. The second point is this. Christians are to be a positive influence in the society. So when we walk by the kingdom's characteristic, Jesus is telling us we have a responsibility and our responsibility is to be a salt and light to our surroundings. And we are to have a positive influence in the society. But some of us are thinking, Jesus, serious ah? People who are poor in spirit, people who are need, who are meek, who are merciful, people who are uh, peacemakers, can they do it or not? Can they actually bring any change? Can they actually do something uh, uh, an, of an impact, a positive impact to their surrounding in this harsh, manipulative, hard world? Yes, Jesus is not suggesting maybe. Jesus is saying, we will be. You are, by your very presence, you are. So the question is not whether should I, it's how can I be. It's not whether we are a sort or light or not, it's not that question. Jesus already said that when we, are, we belong to Him, we are to be. How? The question is how do we become that positive influence? Now in the times of Jesus, there are no fridge, there's no fridge, no refrigeration. So if you want to store food, you want to keep food, like for example, meat and fish, what do you have to do if you don't have a fridge? You use salt, salt to preserve, salt in big quantity to preserve the meat. Jesus is telling us the world. Why are we salt and light to the world? Because the world is like a meat that is rotting. A meat that is rotting that is in need of elements to preserve it. The world is in darkness that needs to be lit up. The Lord Jesus tells us very clearly why we need to be salt and light to the earth and to the world. What He's actually also telling us, the reason why we need to be salt and light is because of the condition of the world. And the condition of the world is one that is decaying. That's why it needs salt. It is in darkness. That's why it needs light. Jesus is telling us also, establish, uh, establishing for us the condition of the world. And this is what Romans chapter 1 reminds us. When the world lives in decay, in spiritual moral decay, and when the world is in darkness, Romans chapter 1, 29 to 32 tells us this is what happens to people who live in that kind of condition. Their lives become full of every kind of weakness, wickedness, sin, greed, hate, envy, murder, quarreling, deception, malicious behaviour and gossip. 
They are backstabbers, haters of God, insolent, proud and boastful. They invent new ways of sinning. They disobey their parents. They refuse to understand. They break promises, are heartless and have no mercy. They know God's justice requires that those who do these things deserve to die. Yet, they do them anyway. Worse yet, they encourage others to do them too. The scripture is very frank with us. The world continues to decay morally, spiritually, live in darkness. And we see that in the pages of the newspaper, right? Recently, I think about a month plus ago, the case of the Hong Kong socialite Abby Choi's murder, remember? So gruesome. So wicked. You know, one of the, the, the gruesome fact was her head was decapitated and then it was put into a boiling pot. Boil until the head is left with only skull. I cannot imagine what kind of people can actually do things like that. But that is the reality that Scripture is very frank with us. The world, even though we pride ourselves, human beings pride ourselves of modernization, civilization, culture, the advancements of things, but that has not helped the soul and the heart of man. Indeed, Jesus says the issue is always the issue of the heart. You can clean the outside, but the problem is the inside. The heart remains corrupted. That's where it birthed the greed, the, the wickedness, the anger. And so that's why the world continues to be in a decaying mode, to live in darkness, exhibiting this kind of behaviour. But Jesus tells us, those who belong to Him, like Him, will become His salt to decay the deterioration. So Christians are to, be posit- to be, have positive influence to society by t- uh, to retard the decay of morality. What does it mean? You and I are to be the people who will not behave likewise, right? We talk about the characteristics of the kingdom, the eight characteristics that Jesus laid out to us. Those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, those who want to seek to do God's will and do what is right in His eyes, will not tolerate with corruption and bribery. Because that's who we are. We stand before God. We say we can't do this. You know, in Malaysia, we all know the word pow. You must pow to get away with something. You know what I mean? Pao means bribe. And one of the most common things that all of us would have experienced is when it comes to getting our driving license, right? Ah, don't say you don't know. Huh? You know, the culture is so sick that it becomes part of the whole package to get a driving license. You have to add your, your courses, the registration of your courses, your fee to get your exam, and then plus you must pow. Right? So it comes to that amount. Christians, we must know that actually if we seek to do what is right, we will not bow. Even though it means that we may have to fail our exam a few times and receipt, pay more money. If we truly do that, and I'm just saying, giving a very normal example, there are many of us here, you are in, you are in businesses, right? I know it's not been easy for you when you deal with certain parties and ex- there's expect- expectancy of certain things to be given, right? And you, and you want to, be, to, be, to have integrity, to walk right. You may have to go through so much more trouble just to do the right thing. People may give you so much of hindrances, obstacles. But can you imagine when a Christian businessman refused to bow? that kind of statement he's making to his, his people in the industry. Think of teachers who, will, even though they, they are the ones that uh, other people are lazy, you know, don't want to do the work, but they're willing to do extra because they want to serve God. They're willing to be meek and not pursue and arm twist their way through the principle, whoever. You know, I'm just giving example, day-to-day examples where by our presence of who we are, meek, Merciful, pure in heart. Our presence itself brings a change to the culture that we are in. Jesus is saying the presence, 
The presence of Christians is the one that will change the element. But our presence must be active presence. Secondly, we are to dispel darkness. We are to stop the rotting, the corruption by our presence, but we are also to bring light, to dispel darkness. There was once a husband who went for an overseas trip to France and came back with a gift to his lovely wife. And this gift is a matchbox that will light up or will glow in darkness. So the wife was so excited, took the little matchbox, went to the room, which is dark, but it didn't glow. And so he turned to the husband, why, you buy cheap skate stuff for me? Ah? The husband said, no, it says it will glow in the dark. Ayah, I'm going to cheat it. Ah. But then the wife saw, hey, there's a fine print underneath, and, and, but it was in French, so he got a friend who can read uh, French and to read. And it says this, if you want me to shine in the night, keep me in the light. If you want me to shine in the night, keep me in the light. In other words, this matchbox, you have to put it outside in the light. Then, when you bring it to somewhere dark, like at night, it will glow. The point I'm trying to make it is this. Jesus asks us to shine. And to shine is to be a light to our dark world. Jesus himself said, I am the light of the world. And now what did he say? You are the light of the world. What Jesus is trying to say is this. I am the light. But if you remain in me, just as John 15 says, if you abide in me, you will keep me in you. If you keep yourself in the light, you will glow. You will glow in your darkness. The light doesn't come from us. The light comes from Jesus Christ, the light of the world. And Jesus says to us, you are now the light. You are the light. You are the light. Because if you stay in me and allow me to work in through you, you will glow. You will glow in the darkness of your environment. But I want to caution us, brothers and sisters, that the fact we live in a world that does not want to see the light. John 3.19 reminds us, this is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. That's why man, humanity by ourselves cannot turn to the light one. The light has to be shined upon them. That's why Jesus has to come. That's why we have to glow. Because the world in its darkness loves to live in the darkness, refuses to go out to the light. That's why we have to come into the light. We have to be part of the world in order that they may see that they are in darkness. Without our presence, there is no differentiation. People don't know that they are living in darkness. You know, I read about this, uh, this journalist who wrote an interesting article. And his article is entitled, Why Clubs Are Dark? And he was writing about nightclubs, uh, uh, pubs, and etc. And he's saying, have you ever noticed why these places are often very dark? And he wrote the article explaining many factors, but one thing that I draw out is this. He says this, the more we know that we are consumed by darkness, the less self-conscious we are because darkness hides things. Very interesting. He's saying that why the environment has to be dark because it allows people to feel brave to do something that they don't want to be seen when in, in broad light. They, broad daylight, for example, it's easier for a man to approach a woman in a, in a rather dark place, you know, with loud music around than a quiet, bright, lit coffee house. And of course, if you add alcohol or drugs into the equation, then comes off many other un unwanted things like... Uh, uh, you know, a promiscuous relationship, one night stand, etc. So often people like to like darkness because they can conceal, do things without thinking that people will take note and will notice. But Jesus reminds us that this itself leads to destruction. And that's why He came. That's why He saved us. And that's why we are then placed to shine God's light to them, to show them there's an alternative to real blessed life. There is a real alternative to happiness. It's not in the pursuit of all this kind of pleasure. They meet you for a short term. After that, it goes away. True contentment comes from God, which we are a participant of it. But Jesus reminds us that if we are to be light, like a lamb, when we place a lamb in a house, people put it in the most advantageous location. 
right? You want to place a light where it can cover most areas of your room. You don't put in some storeroom where else your living room is not littered. There must be a light for maximum exposure. Likewise, we must do that with our lives. Always remember, it's our presence, who we are in Jesus. When placed into an environment, changes things because of who God is in us. Now, the thing is we must be strategic because God is strategic. He sees all of us here as lights and He wants to us to place our light in where we can have ac- maximal exposure to our environment. I know some of us are looking at our country and say, oh, things are not going to change. Maybe we should migrate, go somewhere, somewhere else. Now, don't get me wrong. Sometimes God do call us to other places. I won't dispute and I won't say what God is telling you in the sense of your, His calling for your life. But if God is not calling you very specifically to another place, another nation, then even though this country is going through tough times, you know, we know the culture in our country, we know the corruption state in our country, but you and I are called to be sought and liked by our presence. So, the maximum impact we have is we we think that we go to another place where there are more Christians, there are more acceptable, you know, where the Christian values are more acceptable, we are the majority there. Do you think that is strategically impactful for the kingdom? Or you and I are placed in places where seemingly we are the minorities. But I want to say that, you know, God is continually drawing people, you know. Our impact are actually collective. Like salt, uh, you must be large quantity to have a big impact to be able to, uh, to actually uh, marinate a meat or whatever. Or light, you know, when we come together, it becomes brighter. So even though we may be minority in our nation, but when we come together and we all realise that all of us are light, you know, there is that, that effect of our presence. So wherever you are placed right now, at your workplace, maybe your workplace, you are the minority, you are the one and two Christians, and maybe a lot of them are on one particular faith of people. You know, you always feel like you're, you're bullied because you're the only Christian or the only few Christians there. But don't think it that way. God has placed you strategically because your light will sure shine very bright in that environment. You're the only Christian in your home or you're the few relatives in, among your relatives that are Christian. Hey, you are in a very advantageous situation because now your light will be clearly seen. Jesus is telling us we don't hide our light. We put it out and put it strategically where we can shine the brightest. And how we can shine is we need to rediscover the power of example. Today, we need to offer to the world whom we say is in darkness and in decay a possible good alternative. Take, for example, marriage. Marriage today is breaking down in escalating level, especially after the pandemic. You look at the stats in our own country itself. You know, rising of divorce cases, especially among the young couples. It's not the Christian marriage perfect. But because we know who to turn to in times of struggling through our marriages or to strengthen our marriages, who to turn to to glue us when there's brokenness, it's Jesus Christ our Lord. We have courses like uh, marriage courses based on Christian principles so that we can apply it to strengthen marriages. What is the outcome? The outcome is people outside see an alternative. That marriage can be hard, but it is possible to have healthy, strong marriages despite the circumstances. Parenting. You know, not, I know all of us have our issues with our kids, even if they're growing up in church. All right? But the alternative is that the way we resolve conflicts the way we use prayer and allow prayer in our family to bring us through together. Hospitality. You know, one of the strongest and most powerful examples is when a non-Christian enters into a Christian home. The way they see us relating with one another. The way they see us uh, uh, working through our issues. Hospitality when we bring people and into our homes and see for a non-Christian, if you have an opportunity to seek, speak to them, they will tell you, I've never seen things like that. Of course, we have our weaknesses. I'm not saying everybody, we are to be perfect, but when we establish ourselves earnestly 
before God in our family life, in our marriage, in our work life, in our ethics, in our working, we offer a model and alternative that this is what it can be. The power of example. But Jesus also warns us, we are to be sought and light, we are to have positive influence on society, stop decay, expel, uh, dispel darkness. But he wants us, the third point, about losing our effectiveness as salt and light. Jesus wants us about losing our effectiveness as salt and light. This is what he says to us. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under foot. And again, he says, A town built on a hill cannot be hidden, neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Jesus is saying, you cannot not be salty as a Christian. Okay, don't think of wrong thing, uh, but effectively changing your surrounding. Alright, uh, we are meant to be like that. So we are meant to be salty salt, as per se. Alright? And we are, if we are light, we are supposed to be light, then we cannot be a hidden light. It doesn't make sense. A light must ex be exposed. That's how you function. But why did Jesus, right after he established that we are salt and light, caution us? Why did he immediately spend a few more other verses on cautioning? He spends effort to caution us because he knows exactly that's what will happen to us. We will lose, inverted commas, our saltiness and hide our light. You know why? Because often we want to blend in. Because why? We find that it's very costly to be a salt and to be a light. We don't want to stand out. We want to blend in easier, more convenient. We don't want to rock the boat. We want to stand out, get into trouble. That Jesus tells us and warns us very seriously. That is not who you are. If you are like that, then it's a question. Are you really a salt? Because if you're really a salt and you are really a light, you are a light, huh? you want to shine one. If you want to hide yourself, huh, that is a big question already. Are you really, really a light for Christ? So Jesus doesn't mean his words. He's very clear with us. Salt, you have to be salty. Light, you have to be exposed. Not hidden. Not lose its saltiness. This is the warning that Jesus gives us. But why and how can we lose our saltiness? How do we lose our effectiveness as a Christian? How do we lose our positive impact to our surroundings? We will lose our saltiness when we compromise with the world or learn to love its ways. We must realize this. Every day, there will be a lot of voices around us telling us how we should live our life. What should we pursue? What are the things we ought to live? What we should have? The voice are everywhere. The voice of the world that tells us well, how do we determine success? How do we find our self-worth? How do we be happy? The tons of the voices. If we do not allow God's voice through His Word to undergird us, to anchor us down, we will easily be flushed and pushed around by the world. Slowly, the ways of the world will come into our hearts, our minds, and shape the way we live. And we don't even know because you know why? The evil one knows. He won't go and ask you to kill and steal. He knows you're all good Christian. Ma. Where God want to eat, uh, kill and steal? The evil one always subtly, subtly comes into your mind to, to make you diverted, to make wealth, for example, your God. He can tell you through the words of the world. Well, that's how God blesses. If God blesses you, He will make you rich and successful because God loves you. He's your Father. He's so rich. Surely He wants to bless you materially. So you must pursue all the materials you can get because that is a sign that God is with you. You know, you must have the car, the house and all the things there. Then, you know, you know and God proves that He loves you. That itself Half truth, God wants to bless us, but no, God didn't promise us to bless us. It must be materially. God can bless us materially, but not necessarily that. Just because I'm poor doesn't mean God doesn't bless me. No. 
It's not the determinant factor. But the world can, can subtly say, if you have all this, you ought to have because you know God loves you. And so, what do we need to do to make sure that we don't lose our saltiness, we don't hide our light, become like the world subtly? We have to allow God to speak to us through His Word. Problem with us is we don't know our Scripture. We don't know God's Word. So we don't know our principles and we allow our principles to, to be moulded by the ways of the world. We can't differentiate. They all sound good. But when you know the Word of God and the Holy Spirit speaks to you, you will know the differentiation. Of course, we need the Holy Spirit's conviction to act upon it. But at least you know this is not the way of the world. The world of the world says, you know, you just earn as much, then people will respect you. When you have all the money and power, people will respect you. What did Jesus say? No. When you're humble, God will lift you up. When you put other people's interests first, God will take care of you. That's how God works. So different from the world. So we don't lose our saltiness by grounding ourselves with the Word of God, grounding ourselves with the power of the Holy Spirit. Then we will know how to differentiate and keep our identity, our ways with the Lord. And lastly, if we allow God to help us to keep the saltiness of our salt, and the light, salty salt and hidden, unhidden light will bring glory to God. Turn to the person next to you and say, you will bring glory to God. We say it in humility, yeah? we say it in humility, you will bring glory to God. Jesus says in verse 16, the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Let your light shine. Walk in the characteristics of the kingdom. Then you stand before others. Others will see your life, your good deeds. But notice this, huh? when they see you and your good deeds and your good life and your good character and your good effort, what happens? They will glorify who? Glorify who? Father in heaven. They see you but they glorify who? You are. No, Father in heaven. So we must get this right. Our role is to be His salt and light, right? But the outcome is glory be good to God. Not to self. Not to self. Now what does it mean? We are so to live that man may see our good works, our kindness to our staff, being merciful to even our enemies, our pursuance of righteousness, of doing things right, our integrity. And people say, hats off, this person stands on the shoulders of God. They see our good deeds and glorify our Father in heaven. You know, some of us, I don't know where you have encountered, I've heard this uh, uh, from quite a number of sharing. Sometimes they share, you know, sometimes in, my, when, uh, in this particular uh, sharing, this person is a medical doctor. And this person was sharing with me, you know, sometimes uh, patients will say, hey, doctor, you are a Christian, right? The person said, I never, I don't wear a cross, I never say that I'm a Christian. But I say more than once, people say, hey, uh, doctor, you are a Christian. Huh? Then the person said, yeah, I'm a Christian. Say, something is different about you. There's something very different about you. You know, of course, sometimes the person didn't say, Oh, glory to your father. No, la, the person is not a Christian, right? But I'm sure in the heart is, wow, this person must believe in somebody that can produce that kind of change. And sometimes, it is not just from people's observation. Sometimes when people observe how we live our life, it is also important for us to point them back to God. For example, you are handling a very difficult case in your company, all right, and millions is at stake. You plea with God for wisdom how to manage the situation, and by God's grace, manage to pull through. Your bosses come to you say, "Excellent, excellent work, David, Daniel, or Mary, or whoever," and you say, "Honestly, boss, I didn't thought I could make it. I prayed very hard, but God was good." Gave me this wisdom. We, we must ref deflect that self-glory back to God. You know, we looked at that 
in the life of Daniel, you know, Daniel in the Bible, you know, when he was put in a pos position, you know, whether to choose God or choose his luxurious career by bowing down to the statue of the king, he chose not to. His choice is so clear because I'm sure the king knows that Daniel is a faithful, fervent follower of Yahweh. Because at the end, when Daniel came out of the lion's den alive without being affected at all, the words of the king were so astounding. He said, Daniel, your God is a real God. Only He could deliver you. Glory be to God. Sometimes when we go through sicknesses, illnesses, we share with our ex-colleagues, our friends, and they say, how do you find the strength knowing that you are going through this? And they say, I can only trust in God. And the person say, wow, your faith very strong. Huh? Your God must be very strong. Huh? You know, these are the way we deflect back to God and glory be. We want to point it back to God. And that's how we truly become sword and light. When they see us, they see more than us because they know this person is a very normal person. How a person could have done so much, will go through so much and yet still persevere on. Surely, there is God in this person. That's how we reflect back to God. And so, what we seek as salt and light at the end of the day, we want to ask God as we prayed earlier in our worship, how great is our God amplified through us. May our lives really be glorifying to God. There was once a teacher, this is the last story before I end, uh, a teacher who was teaching a group of boys in Sunday school. It's all boys, little boys. And he was teaching about this passage, Matthew 5, uh, 13 to 16, Salt and Light. And he said this to his boys at the end. He said, he took out a watch and said, boys, what, are these? what is this? They said, it's a watch. What, what is it good for? What does it do? He said, it's to keep time to tell time. And he says to the boys, boys, what if this watch cannot keep time? What is it good for? And the boy says, good for nothing. Oh. And he says, he took out a pencil. What is this? He says, it's a pencil. What does it do? It is to write. And he says, boys, what if this pencil cannot even put a mark? What is it good for? Good for nothing. He took out a knife, a small little knife, and said, what is this? This is a knife. What is it, does? What is it used for? It's used to cut things. But what if you cannot cut anything? What is it good for? Good for nothing, the boy said. And then he says this, Boys, if your life do not bring glory to God, if your life do not bring others to give glory to God, what are you good for? The boy said, good for nothing. I don't know whether a Sunday school teacher should say that, but I think it's very impactful. It really squ squashed off all our thinking of self-pride, you know. Because we like to live for ourselves, for our own name, for our own glory, reputation. But if we get our minds right, as the way the teacher very pointedly shared with the boys in the, in the Sunday school, if our lives do not bring glory to God and do not bring others to glorify God as a sword and light. What are we here for? What are we here for? What are we here for? So, brothers and sisters, let us once again hear these words from Jesus. You are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. Not how you think, not how you feel. You are. You are you are by your very present active presence in your workplace in your homes in your schools in your in the, your community you are the salt that decays the corruption and the downfall of morality you are the light that dispels darkness because they cannot see truth and God may we humble ourselves and say oh Lord Help me to live as Jesus has taught me to live with the kingdom characteristics. Not because I can, but because you can. Let us pray. Let us just take this small moment to just come before God.
perhaps for some of us, we have often shy away from truly showing, revealing our light to others. We just want to blend in, don't want to rock the boat. But Lord, you have clearly tell us we are placed in our homes, in our families, in our workplace, in our schools, so that we may really preserve season for the good of our environment with mercy, with humility, with a passion for God's work and His will, with all that. So we come before you, Lord. Help us not to be afraid, to be ashamed, but to say, Lord, help me. Help me to be your salt and your light. I'm weak, but you are strong. Help me where I'm weak. So Lord, I pray for all of us here, O oh God, that Lord, you will truly empower us to be who you have called us to be. Help us by your deep grace, by the power of your Holy Spirit, to live out and walk in accordance to your kingdom's norm against the flow and the tides of the world. Help us to be courageous. And most of all, as we do so, that truly we will feel the blessing of God, that in the purity of heart, we see you, your beauty, your goodness. In showing mercy, we experience your mercy, so sweet, so new every morning. In the poverty of our spirit, we are made strong. We are made whole in our faith in you. So we thank you, O God. Hear our prayer. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.